So the central thesis for this lecture series is based on the axiom that the actual laws of religion designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and revealed through his messengers and prophets are meant to be very simple, very minimal, complications free and easy to follow. So in this sense, you could say that the synonyms of big fiqh are, you could call it fake fiqh, artificial fiqh, man-made fiqh, fabricated fiqh, all of these words would express the same meaning. The understanding the phenomenon of big fiqh and developing the ability to identify it can greatly help ease our lives. If you recall, throughout the period of the efforts that were made to mobilize funds and uh, resources and support for the recently inaugurated International Center for, of Advanced Islamic Research, ICARE, so whether it be at the level of our World Federation or AFTAB or AFED, you often hear the leadership objecting to any uh, scholarly discussion or deliberation of this kind that is had with members of the general public. In the same way, big fiqh, if you look at it across the Muslim ummah, big fiqh is essentially what fuqaha do. And so there is very little point trying to reason with them or convince them to stop you know, producing and generating big fiqh. What you can do is empower and educate the public to detect and identify what big fiqh looks like. There's a whole group of animals that have been declared haram in Shia fiqh based on fabricated narrations uh, that claim that they're, the reason why they're haram is because they are reincarnations of, of sinful humans. How do we reconcile with such things when two grand ayatollahs have given contradictory views, especially whether something is haram or halal? Whose each tihad do we take and what could be the basis of that? Right, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, 99% of the taqlid that is being done, you're not engaging with the evidence behind scholarly opinions. In fact, as a layperson, you say, I don't care what the evidence behind it is. This is uh, in, in Shia fiqh, if you look at the verdicts of many of the marajah, when it comes to bank interest, you see a similar mind frame, a similar mindset. Thank you for the session. It's uh, very interesting and really, uh, uh, we're getting a lot of knowledge from it. Uh, sorry, but uh, I, I asked, uh, my, my question has already been answered. Thank you so much. Asalaamu Alaikum and uh, <clears throat> welcome again to this uh, Al Isla session. I know it's been uh, a very long time since we've last been here, but uh, We've, we've been doing a lot of things in the background and uh, now we're coming back uh, with this session. These are sessions that we were doing initially, which are, uh, which are where we have a lecture initially and then we do have a question and answer after that. As for now, we already have uh, Sayyid Hur here and um, we will invite him to switch on his camera and come on. Assalamualaikum, salam, Sayyid Hur. It's nice to see you again after a while. Same here, same here. Um, thank you for again taking time and uh, preparing yourself for this particular session on Big Fiqh. Um, I know it's been long coming. I know it's, we've been working and talking about this for a very long time. So, inshallah, uh, you will give us exactly what we are hoping it's going to be a beautiful session um i will leave the floor to you and uh, <coughs> we'll meet later on a question and answer bismillah alhamdulillah <laughs> والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد my respected elders, my dearest youngsters, brothers and sisters in Iman السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته At the very outset, I would uh, like to start by expressing my heartful gratitude to Al-Islah admins 
for organizing this very important series of online lectures, which will revolve around the topic of Big Fet. And I want to express uh, my appreciation to the wider Al Islah community and membership for supporting such beneficial projects and uh, initiatives. I want to thank you, our respected moderator, Al Hajj uh, Samir Bai Karmali, for graciously agreeing to host uh, and moderate these sessions. It's always a joy and a pleasure to share the stage, or I should say the screen, uh, with you and uh, with your permission. And without further ado, I would like to delve straight into the topic um, at hand. And uh, I want to get start with, started with definitions. What do we mean by big fiqh exactly? So big fiqh is a term that we have coined in the tradition of other such similar words, which are popular in contemporary discourse, such as big government, big society, big business, big pharma. You hear a lot of these bigs and they all indicate a larger and more inflated role for certain entities in public life, as opposed to a minimalist function, which some thinkers or theoreticians would prefer for it. So the central thesis for this lecture series is based on the axiom that the actual laws of religion designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and revealed through his messengers and prophets are meant to be very simple, very minimal, complications free, and easy to follow. However, when human beings encroach into the realm of religious lawmaking and arrogate to themselves the right to dictate what God's law should be on a given matter, or to even frame it themselves without any sultan, without any authorization, sanction or warrant from the almighty empowering them to do so on his behalf, then this is what results in the production of big fiqh. So in this sense, you could say that the synonyms of big fiqh are, you could call it fake fiqh, artificial fiqh, man-made fiqh, fabricated fiqh, all of these words would express the same meaning. And I think it also needs to be clarified at the outset because I, I, I can sense a uh, scope for misconception and misunderstanding here. The problem you must remember lies not in human beings making laws. That's perfectly fine. It is perfectly natural for human beings living in a civilized society or community to come together and create legislation which is designed to secure and protect and safeguard their worldly interests. And religion, at least the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a problem with that. The Quran has absolutely no problem with that. A good example of reasonable and unproblematic human legislation could be traffic laws, for example, which nobody should, be, should have a problem with. Similarly, um, in the more recent uh, past, COVID guidelines, lot, lots of rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. Everywhere you go, even in the masjid, when you're asked to turn off your mobile phone uh, in the masjid or in other places of worship, these are all valid examples of man-made laws which are not problematic. There are plenty of benign instances which do not involve any kind of criminal human encroachment into the realm of the divine. Okay, it is understood that this is, you know, it is axiomatic that every culture in history has had a set of norms of rules and regulations about correct and normative and acceptable behavior in society. So the issue is not with human beings making the laws per se, but rather with human beings making laws out of their own pockets or in keeping with their own whims and desires and then falsely attributing them to God and claiming that he has ordained them or sanctioned them for humanity. This is highly problematic because as we had pointed in the earliest series that we did, the Dispelling Hulu series, this constitutes iftira upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inventing and ascribing lies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is regarded by the Quran as the most heinous, atrocious, and unconscionable zulm or offense and wrongdoing that one can be guilty of in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for the purpose of these lectures, big fiqh will essentially be a term that we will be using to refer to iftira-based fiqh. 
okay, to refer to everything that's sold to us as divine law or as religious law, when in reality, there is no sultan, there is no warrant or authorization for it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once that is clear, you should also keep in mind that big fiqh is vastly greater in terms of its sheer volume and size and scope and magnitude. It is way more big than the actual genuine fiqh. So it is not humanly possible for us to account for each and every single instance of it, nor is it the goal of our series to basically cover every single nitty gritty instance of big fiqh. So we're not going to be exhaustive or comprehensive. Rather, our goal here is to educate and empower our membership with a sharp sense of what big fiqh looks like, what its main signs and symptoms are, so that you come out of this series equipped with a reliable set of diagnostic tools based on the Quran and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, which can help you detect and identify big fiqh in your own life and around you, uh, regardless of whether we have covered that specific instance of big fit in this series or not. So our goal should always be to empower and educate and equip, not necessarily to spoon feed, right? So it's, it's along the, the principle of if you teach a man how to fish, you're feeding him for a lifetime, as opposed to if you just give him a fish every single day. So the goal is to empower and liberate uh, and as we do that, and before we do that, um, I do feel we should be addressing a, a common objection that has been raised for quite some time by traditional uh, Jamaat leaderships uh, against these kinds of discussions, okay? So whether it be at the level of our World Federation or AFTAB or AFED, you often hear the leadership objecting to any uh, scholarly discussion or deliberation of this kind that is had with members of the general public. And they point out that these kinds of scholarly, juridical or jurisprudential discussions should only take place within the confines of the Hausa establishment. Or even if you wanna have them outside, you should have these discussions behind closed doors, it is often argued, with a gathering that is attended only by scholars or only by specialists. If you recall, throughout the period of the efforts that were made to mobilize funds and uh, resources and support for the recently inaugurated International Center for, of Advanced Islamic Research, ICARE, uh, they repeatedly reminded uh, us of the fact that the whole purpose of the center would be that it would serve as a venue and a platform for discussing the undiscussable behind the scenes and behind closed doors. So I think uh, we need to address as we are entering into these discussions, and obviously we are having them with members of the general public, uh, it is reasonable to answer this objection and to explain why this needs to be done. To elucidate my take on this, I find uh, an analogy very useful. This analogy is actually found in an urban legend, uh, or it's a... Uh, an urban legend that goes something like this, uh, a, a wise philosopher or some say a marital counselor was once asked, uh, why is it, I think he was asked by a frustrated wife, why is it that married men, for example, uh, discuss their marital problems and issues with their friends very freely, very frankly, and at length, they'll spend hours talking to their friends about their marital problems, you know, mari bairi, akare chene, evitnam chene, and but they will not discuss it with their wives, okay, with the person with whom they have the issue in the first place. And so what is the reason behind this? And so that, uh, that uh, philosopher or that marital counselor responded to this question by saying, well, uh, this is the, the reason why men don't discuss it with the wives and they discuss it uh, with their friends is because they're smart enough to know that there's no point discussing your malaria with the mosquito. The mosquito causes the malaria, right? And so there's no point trying to convince mosquitoes to stop biting human beings or to stop causing malaria. That's not going to work. What you can do if you are truly interested in eradicating malaria and helping humanity is you can empower and educate the members of the general public to protect themselves against uh, malaria and against mosquitoes by uh, using different measures, 
and different kinds of technology that are available to them. In the same way, big fiqh, if you look at it across the Muslim ummah, big fiqh is essentially what fuqaha do. And so there is very little point trying to reason with them or convince them to stop you know, producing and generating big fiqh. What you can do is empower and educate the public to detect and identify what big fiqh looks like so that they can save themselves from the deleterious and negative impact and consequences of big fiqh. And that's why uh, if you want to understand what's, what, what the real benefit of this series is going to be and what is the benefit behind uh, discussing big fiqh, uh, I would argue that the biggest benefit of understanding the phenomenon of big fiqh and developing the ability to diagnose it and discover it, the biggest benefit in this is that it helps you avoid all of the disadvantages of following big fiqh in your life. So what kind of dis disadvantages are we talking about? Well, the first dis disadvantage is that big fiqh violates the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what fiqh should be all about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear in the Quran that he does not desire for religion to be unnecessarily and gratuitously complicated and burdensome for the believers. He states this very explicitly in Surah Al-Ma'idah where he declares, مَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيَجَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely does not desire to place you in unnecessary difficulty. This is Surah 5, verse number 6. Surah 22, Surah Al-Hajj, verse 78. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further emphasizes this when he talks about the religion of uh, Islam, the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He says, addressing us, Allah has chosen you as an ummah. The USP of this religion is that Allah has not placed any unnecessary difficulty on you in this religion. This religion is des designed to be easy and simple and uncomplicated. In uh, the verses of fasting, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yuridullahu bikumul yusra wa la yuridu. Allah desires ease for you. He doesn't de desire difficulty for you. In Surah An-Nisa, he says, Allah desires to make things clear for you. He does not desire confusion and ambiguity and chaos. He desires religion to be something very simple and easy to follow. He desires to lead you on the path of the righteous who came before you. And he desires to forgive you and to turn to you with mercy and repentance. So big fiqh violates all of this vision by unnecessarily um, complicating the deen. Number two, big fiqh also flies in the face of one of the most important goals of the prophetic mission of our noble messenger, Muhammad Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it has been laid out in the Quran. If you look at Surah number 7, verse 157, Surah Al-A'raf, when Allah talks about what the Prophet has actually been sent to do in this world, one of the things he mentions, apart from making everything that's good and useful and beneficial halal, and making everything that's filthy and evil haram, he also mentions, anhum israhum. He has been sent, and one of, his, one of the things on his job description is he has been sent to liberate humanity from burdensome legislation because big fiqh is not a recent phenomenon. It goes back to antiquity. Whenever Allah has entrusted human beings with fiqh, they have added their own stuff to it. And so the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was sent to was sent to this world to abolish, to eradicate, to eliminate big fiqh. And so what a big tragedy that then in his very name, Another department of big fiqh was established within this ummah in different sects. So big fiqh goes against his prophetic mission. anhum israhum. Allah says his job is to remove, to, to liberate and emancipate humanity from the burden of previous big fiqh. Allah actually refers to some of this big fiqh as al-aghlal, as shackles, as chains in which humanity has been bound. And so the prophet has been sent to break these chains. Similarly, 
if you come to point number three, big fiqh also involves and entails, this is an obvious one, it entails and involves engaging in two of the most heinous and unpardonable crimes in the eyes of Allah, which are number one, shirk, and number two, iftira. Uh, so big, big fiqh actually is a form of shirk. If you accept it and follow it, the Quran is very clear on this. Now you might ask, well, what does big fiqh have to do with shirk? I thought shirk was in aqidah. No, it can also be at the level of fiqh. How? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran establishes a monopoly for himself over religious lawmaking and legislation. So when some other entity takes it upon itself to make religious law, that entity essentially sets itself up as a rival and partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hakimiyah, in rulership, without any authorization from him. So when we accept and obey and follow laws, which are the result of big fiqh, and which are made by unauthorized, unsanctioned parties, we end up implicitly accepting and acknowledging this unauthorized partnership. And this is shirk as per the Quran. But this is, remember, in religious law, if as a human being you're inventing laws, but you're not claiming religious sanction, you're not claiming they're from Allah, there is no shirk in that. As human beings, you're free to make your own laws. What you're not allowed to do by Allah is to attribute your man-made laws to him. When you attribute them to him and then sell them as fiqh, as sharia to the public, that's what we refer to and that's what we call big fiqh. So big fiqh is shirk, it involves shirk, and it involves iftira. Iftira involvement is, should be a no-brainer because obviously when you pass something yani, that you have made yourself, you pass it off as Allah's law, you start passing off human opinions, human ijtihadat, human whims and desires as divine law, and you falsely attribute them to God, then this is clear iftira. And actually, if you go to see in the Quran, a direct correlation is established between big fiqh and iftira. You can look at verses, for example, such as Surah Al-An'am, Surah number 6, verse 140. Similarly, uh, Surah Yunus, Surah number 10, verses 59 to 60. Surah 16, Surah Al-Nahl, verses 116 to 117. In these verses, direct correlation is established between big fiqh and iftira. And in fact, big fiqh is referred to as iftira. So that was number three. Number four, big fiqh can result in the most shocking, atrocious, and unconscionable crimes against humanity, such as the unlawful taking of innocent life, in uh, Surah Al-An'am, verse uh, 104, uh, 137, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he says, وَكَذَلِكَ زَيَّنَ لِكَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ قَتْلَ أَوْلَادِهِمْ شُرَكَاؤُهُمْ لِيُرْدُوهُمْ وَلِيَلْبِسُوا عَلَيْهِمْ دِينَهُمْ وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا فَعَلُوهُ فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ Allah says thus, in the eyes of many of the pagans and polytheists, their shuraka, who are their priests actually, and religious leaders, they made alluring, they made fair seeming in their sight, the slaughter and killing of their children in order to lead them towards destruction and to cause confusion in their religion. And if Allah had willed, they would not have done so, hence leave them alone to what they are inventing. So this idea of child sacrifices was introduced by priests and it was sold to the people as something that's actually desirable, that's actually required by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when in reality, it was not required. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids us from infanticide, from uh, any kind of taking of human life, whether it is born or unborn. And so when priests attributed child sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says this is an act of foolishness, this was an iftira, and look at the loss, look at the damage that it resulted in. A few, a few verses later, in verse 140, Allah says, Qad ilmin. Allah says, indeed, they are losers, those who foolishly murdered their children without any certain knowledge and made unlawful that which Allah had provided for their consumption. This is a very big part of, of big fiqh. Uh, this phrase here, when Allah says, وَحَرَّمُوا مَا رَزَقَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِتِرَاءً عَلَى اللَّهُ They made unlawful that which Allah had provided 
for their consumption through engaging in iftira by inventing lies upon him and attributing them to him. They ended up making so much of the halal haram and then they sold it to the public saying, this is actually not us making this haram. This is Allah who has made it haram for you. So Allah says, Qabballu wa ma kanu muhtadeen. They indeed went astray and were not rightly guided. The people who fell for this. It's number four. Number five, as you can see from this verse that I just quoted, another major drawback of big fiqh is that it makes the halal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala haram. It turns the lawful into the prohibited. Despite the fact that the very act of turning halal into haram has been strictly forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. In uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah number 5, verses 87 to 88, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tuharrimu tayyibati ma ahallallahu lakum, wa la ta'tadu, inna Allah la yuhibbul mu'tadeen. O you who believe, do not make unlawful for yourselves the good pure and wholesome things which Allah has made lawful for you and do not exceed the limits. Surely Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. Next verse, he says, Eat and enjoy the lawful things that Allah has provided you with. Be careful of your duty to Allah. Uh, Fear Allah and be careful of your duty to him for it is he whom you have faith in. It is he whom you have belief in. This prohibition is then reiterated in Surah An-Nahl as well. A very important verse to always keep in mind in the context of big fiqh is verses 116 and 117 of Surah 16, Surah An-Nahl. وَلَا تَقُولُوا Allah says, لِمَا تَصِفُوا أَلْسِنَتُكُمُ الْكَذِبَةِ do not describe with your tongues things as being halal and haram unless you have proof from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But just based on your whims and desires, Allah is forbidding us from saying this is halal, this is haram on our own accord. Because Allah says, if you do so, this is, remember, one of the verses we cited to, uh, which establishes direct correlation between big fiqh and iftira upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you say something is halal, when in reality it is not halal in the eyes of Allah, or when you declare something haram, when in reality Allah has not forbidden it, Allah says, Allah this is, you are attributing lies to me then. Allah says, for all those attributing lies to me, they should keep one thing in mind. They shall never attain success. They shall, they shall never attain salvation. Yes, they might attain some temporary enjoyment in the life of this world, some meager profit. But after that, there is only painful punishment for them in the hereafter. Beyond this, Another very major drawback of big fit is that it results in unnecessary and avoidable complications, difficulty and hardship, which can actually repel and turn people who don't know better from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are instances that I've personally come across of reverts to Islam who have run away from Islam. They have apostated back to their uh, previous belief systems or to no belief system because of being uh, put off by so much of the big fiqh that they were asked to follow, which didn't make sense to them. Uh, this is reverts, neophytes. Uh, we have, I recently heard of a case of a student at the Hausa in Qum who apostated, or may, perhaps we, we cannot say apostated, but basically he left the fold of uh, Imami 12 Rashiism because he came across the Bath of Musuh, which we might cover inshallah if we have the time. There is a whole, uh, there's a whole group of animals that have been declared haram in Shia fiqh based on fabricated narrations uh, that claim that they're, the reason why they're haram is because they are reincarnations of, of sinful humans. So the rabbit, for example, According to some fabricated reports in the 12 Imami corpus, the rabbit was forbidden because, well, it is claimed that it was a woman 
who used to not take the ghusl after that time of the month. And so therefore, as a punishment, it was converted into the rabbit. And this is their attributed, this kind of khurafat is attributed to our imams, mostly through weak and fabricated chains, but sometimes occasionally, you shouldn't be surprised if the occasional sahih chain also comes accompanied with such narrations, because as you know, some of the fabricators were very devious and very good at inventing sahih chains as well. But basically there was a student I, I was informed who just uh, left the fold of the faith because of, you know, uh, studying these kinds of, of narrations and being told that this is actually a genuine fiqh. So this is uh, another uh, valid concern that we have about big fiqh. It turns people away from the religion of Allah. It disfigures and distorts the sharia. It diverts it from the purpose and aim for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed and created the sharia. Another major concern that we have with big fiqh is that it can actually replace and override the actual fiqh. And this can result in, uh, in irretrievable loss of actual fiqh. So we can go on and on highlighting a lot of drawbacks and a lot of really negative things that are associated with big fiqh. Um, I think if, if, if we move away from the Quran and, and, and the hadith, and just think about it logically and rationally, I think we can point out that it's already hard enough for a lot of Muslims to follow the actual uh, Islam and the actual Sharia ah in this day and age, especially uh, given the fact that so many of us are living in, um, in, in, in majoritarian, non-Muslim majoritarian societies, especially in the West and in, even in many places in the East. So it's difficult enough to follow the actual deen that, what, that was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our time and in our age. The last thing that we need, need to do and the last thing that Muslims need is for us to burden them with a whole mountain load of man-made laws and fallible opinions while giving them the impression that these are actually divine laws that must be followed on pain of anathema and on pain of damnation. So in view of all of this, we may say that understanding the phenomenon of big fiqh and developing the ability to identify it can greatly help ease our lives. It can aid us in leading meaningful, satisfying and fulfilling lives, enjoying the halal provisions and pleasures of the life of this world to the fullest while remaining guilt free and fully connected with the almighty spiritually. Also, I, I need to uh, issue a, a warning and a disclaimer that when we are talking about big fiqh, big fiqh is not exactly a, a very exotic or rare phenomenon within the Muslim ummah. Okay, as I mentioned, if you do a, a ratio wise, if you do a comparison, there is a lot more big fiqh floating around in the ummah than there is actual fiqh. Okay, there is a substantial amount of fiqh that is currently followed by Muslims today, which is actually purely man-made. It is based on uh, fabricated narrations, weak transmissions, misinterpretations. It is the result of highly personal scholarly views and opinions, which had a specific uh, time and place and context. They are not fit to be universalized and applied uh, all across the globe or all across the world in every time and in every place. So the term big fiqh covers all of this. And, and this is inshallah what we want to uh, what we want to look at. Beyond this, uh, what I want to also go into, inshallah, if time permits, is uh, to, to understand big fit and the phen phenomenon of big fit in Islam. We will also be going into uh, what big fit used to look like in previous uh, nations and communities. Because the Quran does not give us a lot of examples of big fit in our ummah. Obviously, as long as our ummah was under the leadership of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a war that was being declared on big fiqh. So there was simply no scope for any big fiqh developing while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was at the helm. All of this happens after prophets leave the scene. So if you want to derive benefit from Quranic dealings with, with big fiqh, you have to go into, you have to deal with uh, big fiqh in previous nations and in previous communities, particularly within the Ahlul Kitab 
within the polytheists and pagans of Mecca. By looking at what Allah says about their big fiqh, you can learn a lot about our big fiqh. Okay. And so if there is time, I can I can share with you very quickly one example of big fiqh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights. This is actually big usulul fiqh, I think I should say. Um, in Surah Ali Imran, so usul al-fiqh means principle of principles of jurisprudence. You know, it's it's one thing for you to come up with big fiqh at the level of fiqh. Sometimes what happens is that you have big usul al-fiqh, as in you have certain principles uh, that are inserted into usul al-fiqh, which are actually which have no sanction from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But once you accept them as valid principles of jurisprudence, using them, you can derive a whole you know, mountains worth of new big fiqh just based on that one faulty principle. A good example of this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights in Surah Ali Imran. Uh, surah number three of the Quran, you look at verses 75, 76, up to 78. There, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about two groups within the Ahlul Kitab. I mean, Ahlul Kitabi. Allah says some people among the people of the book are so honest that if you were to entrust them, يعني, give them amana uh, of an entire heap of gold, you leave it with them, de de deposit it uh, with them as an amana, they will return it to you. But among the same people of the book, there is one jama'a, there is one group of people who if forget about heap of gold if you were to entrust him with one gold coin he would not return it back to you until you completely you know you 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 stand up on him and you basically you're constantly breathing down his neck that's when he's going to return that trust to you now why is this allah says i'll tell you because they have this faulty usul or faulty asl in their usul al-fiqh, this group of Jews. What is that faulty asl? Allah says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لَيْسَ عَلَيْنَا فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ سَبِيل This is because they say that there is no case against us if we wrong the Gentiles. So the Jews have this understanding, this perception that we are the chosen and favored people of God. Now, their Torah, their, their divinely revealed scripture, as Allah tells us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, inna anzalna Torah fiha huda wa nur. We reveal the Torah, it was full of guidance and light. The Torah teaches you a very high level of morality, very high moral values, honesty, integrity, all of that. The Jews said that all of these high moral values of integrity and justice and fairness and trustworthiness, yeah, these only should apply to our dealings with each other, us Jews, the favor of people of God. When you deal with Gentiles, you don't need to follow all of this. You can defraud them, you can cheat with, you can cheat them, you can be dishonest with them, you can do whatever you like with them. And they were actually doing this with the Arabs. Not all of them. Allah says a portion, a section. The Quran is always very careful not to uh, issue blanket statements or to make unfair generalizations. Allah says there is a party among them whose uh, scholars and rabbis have, have given them this understanding of usul al-fiqh. That laysa alayna fil ummiyina sabil. We are not obligated to follow the highest principles of ethics and morality in our dealings with non-Jews. Allah says uh, immediately after mentioning this usul al-fiqh, or oh, this asl min usul al-fiqh, Allah says, وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they tell a lie against God while they know it. Yani Allah is saying this asl that you have invented from your pockets and that you're now attributing to me, because that's what they used to say. They used to say our religious law says that this is only applicable to Jews, not applicable to non-Jews. So Allah says, you are claiming this is what I taught you? If this is what you're going to claim that I taught you, you're doing iftira upon me. When did I ever teach you this? I never taught you this. What did I teach you? Allah says in verse 76, Bala man awfa bi ahdihi. Fa inna Allah, Allah says my teaching is simple. Whoever fulfills his promise and guards against evil and restrains himself from harming others, 
then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are muttaqeen. Allah has taught you self-restraint and he has taught you to keep everyone safe from your harm, regardless of whether they belong to your faith community or they do not belong to your faith community. You have to maintain uniform standards with everyone. You can't defraud people just because they don't belong to your community or your tribe or your nation or whatever group grouping that you subscribe to. But unfortunately, the Jews do not have this understanding. They, a, a section among the Jews were actually violating this law of God. They were violating this principle. Now, how does this concern us? Remember, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam says what? He says, Whenever Allah talks about Jews, he talks about pagans, polytheists, past communities. He's talking about them in your book because he knows you are vulnerable and you are at the risk of falling prey to the same kinds of misinterpretations and misunderstandings and self-serving uh, conceptions. So he's warning you of this so that you should be aware. But unfortunately, did the Ummah follow this? Did the school of Ahlul Bayt, did our fiqh follow this? Maulana, there is a lot to be said about this. Because uh, yes, as far as the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are concerned, 100%, we have hadith of Imam Ali bin Musa Rida, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, he says, thalathun lam yaj'ali allahu ta'ala fi hinna rukhsatan adau al-amanati lil barri wal fajir. He says there are things in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, three particular things in which Allah has made no relaxation. He has left no exceptions. Ada'ul amana, returning deposits. When someone entrusts you with an amana, he says it doesn't matter whether it is fajir, fasiq, it is Saddam Hussein or Adolf Hitler. Imam Zain al-Abidin it is attributed to him that he said, if, if the killer of my father were to entrust the sword with which he killed my father, I would return it, right? So in the value system of the Ahlul Bayt, Ada'ul Amana, Barran Kana Al Fajira. Whether righteous, unrighteous, you have to return the Amana. So in the same way, kindness to parents, Barraini Kana Al Fajiraini. Whether they are righteous, whether they are wicked, doesn't matter. Allah has allowed for no ifs and buts. The third thing, honoring your pledges, your contracts, your treaties, whatever agreement you enter into, you have to honor that regardless of what, what the party that you've entered into uh, an agreement with is, whether it is righteous, whether it is wicked, doesn't matter. This is the value system of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa salatu wa salam. But unfortunately, if we go into the fiqhi literature, uh, if there if there is time, I can I can show you some some very disturbing evidence of how there, there have been uh, departures, very obvious and very clear uh, departures uh, from this. So, for example, this is Masbah al Faqaha fil Muamalat. This is an advanced level a textbook of fiqh. Uh, that has been uh, authored on the basis of lectures delivered by Ayatollah al uzma as Sayyid Abu Al-Qasim Al-Khu'i. This is his commentary on Al-Makasib Al-Muharrama by uh, Sheikh Murtad Al-Ansari. Okay, this is taught in the uh, Hawza. And the edition that we are using here is the uh, fourth edition published by Muassasat Ansariyan from Qum. Okay, published in 1996, uh, 1417 AH. This is volume number one. Yeah, you can, we, we can look at the section on the on cursing the believer, for example. He goes on to clarify how when we define a mu'min, for example, not only cursing the believer, but also backbiting the believer. Okay. Uh, when it comes to cursing or backbiting the believer, he says that the definition that we have to go by, and this has been the traditional understanding within, uh, within uh, the fiqh, is that a believer is often defined as someone uh, who is uh, a follower of your subsect within the Muslim Ummah. So a person who does not believe in your in the same belief system as you uh, may be a Muslim, even if he testifies to the Shahadatain, for example, he will not be considered a Mu'min. He will be considered a Muslim, but he will not be considered a Mu'min. Now, 
The issue with not regarding non-Shia, for example, as mu'mineen, is that in these chapters, you, he then goes on to say that, well, the prohibition in the Quran against, for example, backbiting the mu'min, or in the hadith against cursing or abusing or slandering the believer, for example, these prohibitions apply only to people from within your own community. They do not apply to those who are outside your community. So essentially, when it comes to the, the mukhalif, when it comes to someone who opposes you in terms of sectarian aqidah, then it would be permissible, according to this understanding of the law, to backbite them or to even use abusive language for them. Because the prohibitions of the Quran against this are restricted to believers, and then big aqidah is used to define what a believer actually is. So you can see the kind of uh, dehumanization and otherization of the other that this results in. And this is not only on, on the Shia side of things. There is a lot of big fit of this kind on the side of the Sunnis as well, and on the side of the, the, the Salafi Turaf as well. And that's why you will find, for example, Sheikh Muhammad Tahir bin Ashur in his tafsir, he actually writes that uh, his actual words uh, are that these blame blameworthy traits for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned the Jews, there are many Muslims who have adopted this characteristic, whereby they started viewing themselves and the Muslim Ummah as some kind of chosen tribe or chosen community. So when it came to, for example, the rights of the, the Dhimmis, those uh, non-Muslims who were living within the uh, umbrella and protection of the Islamic State, some Muslim fuqaha and jurists, if you look at their writings and if you look at their law, they allow you to violate the rights of these uh, non-Muslims. Many fuqaha, even to this very day, allow you to violate the law of the land for non-Muslim countries because they claim that these are Darul Harb. These are, uh, you know, Darul Harb was a concept, a medieval concept of, you know, where they used to divide the world into two parts, Darul Iman and, or Darul Islam and Darul Harb. That, you know, the land of Islam and every land that is not majority Muslim and not being ruled by an Islamic government is basically a land that we are at war with which is a completely un-Quranic concept. The Quran talks about how you can have peaceful coexistence and uh, treaties in place with, with non-Muslim parties. So in any case, these are all examples of how when you have uh, wrong uh, conceptions and misunderstandings of this kind, where you start thinking that we are the chosen people or we are special people, then you tend to otherize and dehumanize those who differ with you uh, even sometimes when they are part of the same ummah as you, but because they don't follow the, the sect that you follow, uh, you end up uh, dehumanizing them and otherizing them. And on the basis of this dehumanization and otherization, you then make the halal of Allah, sorry, you make the haram of Allah halal in the sense that all the immoral and unethical behavior that Allah has forbidden, you say that it doesn't apply to these people. We can be unethical with them. We can be immoral with them because they do not have uh, these rights. These rights are only confined to the believers. So this is how this kind of uh, understanding results in big fiqh. And the ibra, the lesson we should take away is that when Jews did this or a section of the Jews did this, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned them for this. Uh, if you look at verse 78, uh, 77 uh, of Surah Ali Imran, okay, Allah talks about this. He says, وَإِنَّ مِنْهُمْ لَفَرِيقًا يَلْوُونَ أَلْسِنَتَهُمْ بِالْكِتَابِ لِتَحْسَبُوهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ That there is among them a party, among the people of the book, there is a group who alter and distort the scripture with their tongues so that you may consider what they're reciting of their own self-created words to be part of the divine book, when in reality, it is not part of the divine book. And they say it is from Allah while it is not from Allah. And they tell a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens them. This is verse 77. 
Allah threatens them with, with grave punishments for this. He talks about how he will not speak to them on the day of judgment, how he will not purify them, how he will not uh, have anything to do with them on the day of judgment because of how they lied against him. So this is basically just one example from one past community. Unfortunately, this understanding has penetrated the Muslim Ummah as well. It has resulted in a lot of artificial, inflated, uh, big fiqh. And uh, this is what we want in this series, inshallah, hopefully, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to raise awareness about this. We want to warn against this. We want to highlight instances of this. And inshallah, through the course of these lectures, uh, the hope is that you will also develop the ability to detect and identify these kinds of things and uh, to be able to then protect yourself from it, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you so much for the very, very enlightening uh, introduction session, which I'm sure is very important for us to actually set the foundation because I know you will want to continue as I can see that there's a lot of information that you have that you would like to share. Um, I will open the floor to questions. Uh, we have one person who's raised their hands. There's a written question um, in the chat. However, I just wanted to go back to, uh, if you can quickly, the rabbit uh, bit. You said that we're not allowed to eat rabbit because the rabbit was an incarnation of a woman. Who would not do ghusl, yeah. This, this is actually a claim but that... We don't believe in hmm? But we don't believe in reincarnation. Exactly. But if you go into the 12-hour imami hadith corpus, you will see narrations attributed to the imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wasalam, in which they claim reincarnation. They, they claim that entire animal species are reincarnations of humans. So the elephant is the reincarnation of a, a, a king who used to do a lot of zina and adultery, for example. Um, the elephant is one example. The rabbit is another example. All sorts of birds. You have certain birds who are... So these are all humans who were punished, it is claimed. And uh, their punishment was that they were converted into these animal forms. And therefore, we as human beings should not, um, should not be consuming them. And so this is actually, when, when you go deep into the study of fiqh, this is not stuff they will teach you at madrasa, and this is not stuff you will hear from the member, but when you study fiqh at the advanced level, you will see there is a whole bab, a whole bahth, which is called hurmatul musuq, the prohibition against reincarnated animals. And uh, the vast majority of Cholver imami fuqaha actually accept this, at least in their advanced bahthul kharij, they do not uh, refute this, or they do not... Uh, Sometimes what, what I found very striking was that even someone of the level of uh, Ayatollah, Sheikh Haider Hubbullah, uh, he has very incisive discourses into fiqhul aqima wal ashriba, the fiqh of food and drinks. And even he has a section on this where he, he does point out how most of the narrations about this are not reliable, they're weak, many of them are fabricated, um, but he doesn't outright negate this whole mabhath and say that it's it's all man-made and so he does uh, accommodate it to a certain extent which uh, is kind of surprising or perhaps his circumstances do not permit because he was giving these lectures in, in the Hausa of Qum so but yeah there there is a lot of acceptance for these kinds of uh, furafat at the, at the higher level unfortunately so somebody in the chat has just written Allama Majlisi was against reincarnation and supported uh, Raja. Um, so I don't know if this is correct, but like I'm still I'm still baffled in the whole thing. But I mean, let me formulate my question a little bit better. In the meantime, um, there is there was a raised hand that I can't see anymore. But if uh, if the member would like to raise their hands again, I will allow them to ask the question. In the meantime, there is um, there's a question here that says, "Dear Sayed, you have said uh, you have said to not take the rulings of Mujtahid <clears throat> as they are not based on Quran and Sahih Hadith, but in their own ishtihad. Allah tells us in Quran to ask the people of knowledge regarding the domain we are not aware of. 
Um, if you can quickly just summarize um, that, and then I'll ask the second question that's in the chat as well. Right. So this is a kind of uh, implicit iftira against me to say that uh, I am saying that don't take the rulings of the mujtahid. No. Who is saying don't take the rulings of the mujtahid? I am not even saying that uh, there shouldn't be ijtihad. What I am saying is that if a certain ruling is the result of man-made activity, it is a, it has been, uh, it's a human being, whether it be a mujtahid or a non-mujtahid, any ruling that emanates and originates from a human being should not be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what is wrong. As long as a mujtahid says, look, this is my personal opinion, take it or leave it, there's no, nothing wrong with that. The problem becomes when you take the verdict of the mujtahid, which has no basis in the Quran and Sunnah, and then you say, this is a hukum of Allah. This is the requirement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what then results in big fiqh, because Allah will question you on the day of judgment and say, where is the evidence and where is the dalil? Hatu burhanakum. As Allah says in the Quran, on the day of judgment, I will say, bring forward your proof. What proof do you have that this is from me? So if you can show Allah the proof from his book or from the established sunnah of the messenger, وسلم, you're good to go. But if this was simply a human opinion, then you shouldn't have been selling it to the public as divine law. You should have been upfront with the public. You should have said, this is the human opinion of a fallible scholar. Take it or leave it. Okay. Um, so, all right. So now, now that you've 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 clarified that that if if the ruling is in conjunction with the Quran, with the rulings uh, that have already been that are not man-made and then attributed to Allah, then it's fine. Then we are okay with that. Okay. So the question, the follow-up question that was here is, uh, it says uh, so. There's a quite number of rulings that are not explicitly mentioned in the Quran. In this case, uh, we have to dive into hadith as they are based on. In case if the ruling is based on a weak hadith, we can ignore it. But what do we do in case the ruling is based on sahih hadith? As we know, the, the hadith are considered to be sahih, also have a chance to be fabricated by nature by gulat. How do we deal with these rulings in this case? Do we ignore the whole ruling based on hadith corpus regardless if it is sahih or not? I think um, to concise this particular question is to say what you are trying to do is how do we now um, use this information to understand if the, the, the ruling is one that we should be following or we should be aware of. Yeah, you basically said it that you want to empower and educate the members to understand uh, where this big fiqh really is. So in this particular case, what would you tell the member? Like what to do? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, and, and lay people should know that it's not very easy to dismiss something as big fiqh. Uh, to dismiss, you, you, you don't want to end up dismissing something that's actually part of the deen as big fiqh because that then results in other disasters. So when it comes to hadith, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslam have left us with very clear instructions and injunctions on how to deal with hadith. So a hadith having a sahih chain or a da'if chain, these are dhanni indicators as the scholars of Rijal and Usul themselves accept. Uh, a, a hadith being da'if is not 100% guarantee that it is fabricated. And a hadith being a sahih is not 100% guarantee that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Imams of Ahlul Bayt said it or transmitted it. So, what does give you 100% certainty is the Quran. The Quran is 100% qat'iyu sudur and it is mutawatir. There is no doubt about it. So that's why Imam al-Rudha said, I'ridu kalamana ala kalami rabbina. You take the hadith first of all to the court of the Quran to see how well it corresponds with the worldview of the Quran. Can it even be accommodated within the worldview of the Quran? If you spot any contradiction between the Quran or the worldview of the Quran, the spirit of Quranic legislation, if you, con if you see the hadith contradicting it, you throw it out, regardless of whether the chain is sahih or not. Remember, Imam Ridha alayhi salam said, and Imam Ja'far Sadiq alayhi salam said, Kainan man kan. Once you find a hadith to be contradicting the Quran, don't care who reports it. Don't care who narrates it. Meaning, even if the narrators are all trustworthy, even if the chain is sahih, Kainan man kan. No matter how sahih it is, throw it out. 
Because whatever contradicts the Quran, the Imam says, it is just embellished speech. Don't fall for it. So we have very clear instructions uh, for how to detect big fib or how to de detect fabrications. The most important instruction is to compare against the worldview of the Quran. The Quran gives you, inshallah, as we will go through this series, we will start highlighting for you Quranic principles that will help you understand, oh, okay, so if this Quranic principle is true, then this hadith just simply cannot be true because these, you know, these two are a direct contradiction of each other. So inshallah, the more you get uh, used to this and the more you become familiar with this, the easier it will become to for you to detect what hadith you can trust and what hadith you cannot trust? Um, sir, there is another uh, there is another query here, and uh, thank you for answering that question. The person who asked the question is appreciated. So I think you've hit all the correct notes. Um, <clears throat> there is a question here that says, "Well, it's not a question. Uh, well, it's a question." It says in Surah Al Baqarah, um, it, they've given an ayat here. It's uh, I, two, um, 173. And uh, in the translation, it says, um, using Sahih International, it says, he has only forbidden you dead animals, one blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dictated by other than Allah. Um, but whoever is forced by necessity, um, neither desiring it nor transgressing the limit, there is no sin upon him. Indeed, Allah is all forgiving and merciful. So the person is saying, does this mean that besides find all animals, air, land and sea, including dogs are halal? I think in this particular case, it is uh, uh, the way I read the ayat is if you are being forced by whoever is forced by necessity um, and not desiring to do it, then it's OK. I don't know if I got that right. Right, so it says So even haram animals become halal if you find yourself in an emergency. Mm -hmm. Right, when the goal is not for you to break the law of Allah, but rather to save your life. But the, what, what the brother is saying here, inshallah, this is also something that we will go deeper into. And we will present to you the insight of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt about verses like this. So uh, because the Quran uses Adatul Hasan, this is a very beautiful and beneficial uh, aspect of Quranic legislation, is that when the Quran uses Adatul Hasr, Adatul Hasr means an article of restriction. So the Quran doesn't say, for example, that all oh, you who believe this, this, and this is halal. Because if it were to say, if it were to mention the things that are halal, then the rest would have to be assumed to be haram, right? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did out of his mercy was he highlighted the haram. And while highlighting the haram, he used restrictive articles such as innama or qulla ajidu, that nothing is haram other than these things to show you. And this is, uh, this is from where, this is the place from where the fuqaha and the jurists of the Muslim ummah across the sects have derived the principle of aslul ibaha or asalatul ibaha that everything is permissible by default sometimes the question is asked well how do we know that everything is permissible by default and not haram or impermissible by default as many people like to assume you know uh, we have a lot of big fit at the level of you know daily practice as well like for example when it comes to the bathroom floor or or, or you know the road people have this tendency to assume everything is najis until it is proven to be tahir. Whereas the reality is everything is, is to be assumed to be tahir until you have absolute qat'i proof that najasa is there. Similarly, in halal and haram also, until and unless qat'i proof is found, you cannot declare anything to be haram. And so verses like this have definitely been used by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, as well as the fuqaha of this ummah to establish this principle of asalatul ibaha, that everything by default is halal and permissible. And that's why Allah does not bother to tell you or to give you a comprehensive list of halal things, because that would make the Quran infinitely long or virtually uh, infinite. Whereas so, what the Quran does is, is it highlights what is haram. 
so that okay, we can so in that. this particular case let's let me just very quickly uh, on a tangent um, the flesh of dog is not mentioned anywhere um, then I mean would it be logic that we should not eat a dog's meat because it's unclean and it eats flesh which is you know like carcasses and all that stuff is that where we would go to right so for those animals which are neither mentioned as being haram in the quran or in the hadith so for example in maliki fiqh they actually used to accept that dog is not haram and uh, many of the scholars do not even accept that it is najis uh, rather they say the saliva is what is uh, because the, the najasa was derived from narrations, uh, especially in the Sunni corpus, you have narrations where the prophet instructed that when a dog licks a vessel, then that vessel needs to be purified. So they said, well, that only proves najasa of the saliva, because the the dog does not sit in the in the vessel, so that you should say that the whole body is najis. That's why the the prophet asked the vessel to be washed, but rather. Uh, and aslan, even the prophet asking you to wash something could, could be an instruction based on hygiene. It's not necessarily an issue of tahara and najasa, as, as some would argue. But inshallah, we will go into more detail about how the imams of Ahlul Bayt, uh, what they had to say about these kinds of animals that have not been mentioned in the Quran. How, what, what to do with them? But in general, what we can say is that, yes, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger have not expi explicitly made a certain animal haram, then you can discourage people from eating it on other grounds. You can make a medical case against it. You can make a cultural case against it. You can make all sorts of cases against it. But do not use religion. Because the moment you use religion to forbid something that Allah himself did not forbid, then you're, that results in big fiqh. And that is iftira upon Allah as the Quran and Ahlul Bayt and Islam teach us. Okay, that's, uh, I think that covers uh, the multiple questions that have come with regards to this particular, um, with this particular questioning. Um, there is a question here, um, there's no hands, yeah? No, no, there are no hands. Um, so, uh, there is a question here at the bottom that says, um, I heard in one of your lectures saying that Ayatollah Sistani and Ayatollah Khomeini had contradictory views about the halal and haram of peacock. How do we reconcile with such things when two grand Ayatollahs have given contradictory views, especially whether something is halal, haram or halal? Whose ijtihad do we take and what could be the basis of that? Right, that's a very good question. And again, in order to be able to decide whose ijtihad you want to follow, what you would have to do is look at the underlying evidence, which unfortunately currently is not uh, provided to you as a lay person. Because uh, the way taqlid is done today, uh, even though they have tried to change the definition, definition of taqlid, particularly Sayyid al khuy onwards, they have changed the definition of taqlid. In the past, uh, our classical scholarship used to say taqlid simply means qabulu ra'i al ghayri bi ghayri hujja accepting the opinion of someone else without looking at the evidence behind it. That, that was taqlid. But in the modern period, the scholars said, you know, this is because even the classical scholars, they forbade taqlid on this basis. They said, uh, this is qabih, this is highly irrational to follow someone's opinion without looking at the evidence. Well, what do you know? Maybe that guy is relying on, or maybe that scholar is relying on fake evidence or false evidence or uh, um, nonsensical evidence. How will you know if you don't ask for the evidence? And so uh, this was the, the view in the classical period. In the modern period, they've tried to move away from this to say that, no, 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 it shouldn't be such a, a blind process. But this is in theory. In practice, unfortunately, 99% of the taqlid that is being done, you're not engaging with the evidence behind scholarly opinions. In fact, as a lay person, you say, I don't care what the evidence behind it is. And because you say that and you give that impression to, to the scholarship, the scholarship then doesn't bother to give you with the evidence. They just give you the zubda, they give you the, the cooked food. And so if you continue with this kind of mind frame, then you will never know why Sayyid Sistani permits, uh, why Sayyid Sistani permits the peacock and why Sayyid Al Khomeini forbids the peacock. In order to know which ijtihad is worthy of being followed in this case and which one isn't, 
there is no way other than to look at the underlying evidence. Okay, so there is there is a need for specific um, research in in some cases. I know there is a question on interest, and I know if we get into interest, we're going to go into a lot of other sort of venues. But would you be open to discuss interest in big fix sense um, in a later um, sort of session? Then we can have this question uh, asked at that at that juncture instead of adding it right now because it is big fix at the end of the day. Definitely, a lot of understandings of interest do constitute a uh, big fifth. I was actually going to mention an example in this lecture itself when I was talking about how the Jews had made a section of the Jews had made uh, one set of laws for themselves and another set of laws for others. This is uh, in, in Shia fiqh, if you look at the verdicts of many of the Marajah when it comes to bank interest, you see a similar mind frame, a similar mindset, whereby they say that interest, it is permissible to consume it from non-Muslim banks, mm -hmm. but it is not permissible to consume it from Muslims or from Muslim banks. So again, if you have to look at the underlying issue, if interest is exploitation, if this bank interest is the same riba that the Quran is talking about, then the Quran is very clear that riba is a form of zulm, it's a form of exploitation, it's a form of grave injustice that you inflict upon a person. So if a riba is injustice and if this bank interest is that kind of injustice and riba then it is it should be universally haram you can't say it is it, it, it is haram between believers and halal for us to charge uh, to to act as loan sharks or to act uh, you know in this manner in this exploitative manner with unbelievers this kind of dichotomy is uh, unquranic or rather anti quranic but unfortunately as i said you will see reflections of this Jewish mindset um, within Islamic scholarship as well, unfortunately. And interest is one such example where it is permitted for non-Muslims, uh, but not permissible for, for, for Muslims. Whereas the reality is what you should be doing is investigating whether the bank interest in its current form, Aslan, is riba or not riba? Is there exploitation involved in it or not? If it is exploitation, you shouldn't be able to uh, take it from any bank, Muslim or non-Muslim. If it does not involve any kind of exploitation, and if it, it can be determined with certainty that it's got nothing to do with the riba that the Quran talks about, then it should be halal and permissible to take from all sorts of banks, regardless of whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. But yeah, definitely, inshallah, these are things we can go deeper into as we pr uh, progress through this series, inshallah ta'ala. Excellent. Um, there was a hand that had gone up, but uh, I think it's gone down again. However, um, if it goes up, I will I will allow them to ask their question. There is another uh, question here that says, uh, I have a question about halal meat. Um, Sayyid Fazlullah said that meat from halal kitab such as Jews is halal, such as kosher meat. I've been researching this issue on my own and in the Quran there is no mention of a Muslim uh, needing to slaughter while invoking Allah's name. Plus Jewish slaughter is very similar to Islamic slaughter as long as they follow the rules. What other, what other, uh, what other opinions have you come across along these lines um, and please give your thoughts and insights on this. Right. This is a matter that has divided Muslim scholarship from early times because the verse of the Quran in which Allah permits the food of the Ahlul Kitab, he uses the word ta'am, which So many people, based on uh, a certain understanding, uh, cultural contextualized understanding of Arabic, they took ta'am to refer to seeds and cereals and grains basically non-meat products. So that's why they confined uh, permissibility of Ahlul Kitab food to non-meat products. And they forbade the meat of the Ahlul Kitab because they said it comes under وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ or uh, sorry, uh, the other prohibition, which is وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Do not eat meat on which the name of Allah was not recited or invoked at the time of slaughter as Allah says in Surah 6, verse 121. So 
they took uh, this verse to mean that, yeah, Ahlul Kitab, what is known about them is that they do not, uh, especially Jews, I find this very intriguing because I've heard very contradictory testimony. I've heard people who have socialized with Jews and have friendship with Jews who say, and I've also seen this in, in Jewish scholarly writings, they say that uh, we are not supposed to invoke the name of God at the time of slaughtering an animal. Why? Because Jews have a law that says, a commandment that says, thou shalt not invoke the name of God in vain. Yani for them, the name of Allah is a very holy and sacred thing that you don't just, you know, like we Muslims say, oh, every time, subhanAllah, mashallah, inshallah, um, especially when we, we we don't intend to do something, <laughs> we, we invoke Allah more and say inshallah and things like that. Jews are not like that. Jews say that Allah's name should only be invoked in very, very solemn settings, you know, when you're in worship. And so even at, if you look at Jewish websites, they will not, even when they have to mention God, they will not spell his name in full. They will leave a blank because they want to honor that law that you don't take the name of God in trivial matters because that is kind of trivializing God in their conception. So when it comes to slaughtering animals, uh, it makes perfect sense for those who report that Jews don't take uh, the name of God because for them, slaughtering an animal is not a very sacred activity. It, it's a very mundane task. And so... According to this understanding of their law, they shouldn't be taking the name of God at the time of slaughter. And if they don't take it, then their kosher meat and and, and basically any any animal that they slaughter would not be halal. It would be fisk. Allah says any animal on whom the name of God has not been invoked at the time of slaughter uh, should not be consumed. So let me ask you a question. <clears throat> I was in Georgia. Um, these guys are Orthodox uh, Christians. So very different. And when speaking to them, they say, yes, when they slaughter an animal, uh, they, they use a sharp knife, it's edge to edge, the, the blood has to uh, flow out, and then they complete the cut. And while they do that, they face east for whatever reason, and they do say a prayer, um, hence invoking the Lord. Now, their then the name that they use is not not the name we use for God. So what do you do? So there are two issues here. As far as names is concerned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very uh, generous and liberal in this matter. Allah says, call him Allah, call him Rahman. All, all his names are beautiful. So Yahweh, Allah, you know, Ishwar, th these are all different names for the same reality, right? Um, yes, a, a, a problem emerges when, when you look at many religions and their understanding of this one God, it has been corrupted by shirk, right? So within Christianity, when they invoke the name of God, uh, did they have Jesus in mind? Or did they have the father in mind? That's always uh, a confusing matter. If you look at the, the literature of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, also they also say that, you know, when it comes to slaughtering, they say we only rely on, on Muslim, uh, Muslim hands in, in, in these matters because uh, in their cultural milieu, uh, you could not depend on, on non-Muslims to honor your slaughter regulations. But then again, this is very much an issue of context. Uh, what context do we find ourselves in? Okay. Uh, all right. Um, there, there is a. There are multiple other questions, and they've been coming randomly on the chat. So um, I need to go back. Um, there is one question that says, if making something. Um, Haram that is not officially mentioned in the Quran becomes iftara. Then wouldn't we start making everything halal? Example, Quran has not mentioned marijuana as haram. So, um, right. Well, that, that's the question. Yeah. So the question says, um, so I don't want to do iftara, so I will assume halal. Mm -hmm. No, so there are other, you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not uh, limited you from making cases. 
as I mentioned, you can, for example, cigarette smoking has also not been forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we can make a very strong medical case against it. We can is issue advisories. We can discourage people from it. Mm -hmm. In the same way, there are certain things which Allah has actually forbidden. Uh, and there are things that come under that category, even though they are not uh, explicitly named by Allah. So, for example, everything that intoxicates, everything that clouds uh, your judgment and basically uh, induces a state of intoxication and inebriation, whether it be alcohol or whether it be drugs, it can be very easily argued that drugs have the same impact, if not worse, than what alcohol has. So these kinds of things which fit very neatly into pre-existing divine prohibitions, you can make a case for that. No one is stopping you from that. And that is not iftira. You mm -hmm. can say that based on what Allah has, based on the vision of Allah in the Quran, he has forbidden us from alcohol. The Prophet wasallam placed a blanket ban on all intoxicants. He even gave us the legislative intent and rationale. He said, this clouds the intellect. And so anything that paralyzes your intellect, and renders, incapacitates you, it deprives you of your free will and volition is haram. So all the products that human beings will manufacture until the day of judgment that come under this category would uh, easily fit pre-existing prohibitions. But yes, if there is something completely new and there is no way to fit it into a pre-existing prohibition, then yes, Allah has not authorized us. He has not given us license to declare things haram from our pocket. The most you can do for them is argue that, okay, this thing is munkar. Okay, munkar is basically something that society considers to be evil. So you can argue, and Allah allows you in the Quran, in fact, he encourages you to do nahi anil munkar, to prohibit people from evil. So even if that evil has not been mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah, but if the human fitrah recognizes it as evil, as abominable, as reprehensible, then you can label it munkar and warn people against it under the heading of it being munkar. But if you go back to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and even the early, very early scholars of the Muslim Ummah, they had very severe reservations about using the term haram. Because that verse from Surah An-Nahl that I quoted in front of you, Surah 16, verse 116, because Allah has explicitly made the appeal that وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُوا أَلْسِنَتُكُمُ الْكَذِبَ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ Because Allah has specifically appealed to us that don't declare things halal and haram by your own, uh, according to your own whims. Because Allah has established a monopoly and reserved these terms for himself, the er Imams of Ahlul Bayt and the very early Muslim scholars used to say that even if something is really bad and evil, but if it's not there in the Quran and Sunnah, we will not use the terms halal and haram. We, we will use other terms. Even if you go study the Sunnah very carefully and critically, you will see that the Prophet ﷺ himself, even though he had authority, but for most of the things that Allah had not explicitly forbidden, but he wanted to discourage people from it. The term that, that appears uh, in the books of Hadith is Naha Rasulullah. The Holy Prophet discouraged from this. The Holy Prophet uh, prevented people from this. But he doesn't say Harrama Rasulullah. The Holy Prophet made this haram. Because haram was a term that was supposed to be reserved for a very specific list of items that Allah has actually made haram. Okay. Uh, there's uh, there's another question um, here, um, but it's 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 a long it's got it's got a narrative on it, and we've already crossed an hour forty three minutes uh, since the start of our session, and I really don't want to prolong it uh, for the benefit of those who'll be watching it later on. We can put these questions on the back burner and um, ask them on your on your next session. Uh, about about najasat and uh, stuff like this. Uh, so, um, like there, the the follow up question and clarification about my question about the reincarnation of the elephant. If it's one king who did something and was reincarnated into an elephant, are all elephants then the reincarnation of the same elephant who was the king who did the bad thing? Right. Yeah, because he was the father elephant. 
Okay, the, the first elephant, that's how uh, he's supposed to have come into existence. And all the elephants that you see today are descendants of that elephant who himself is a transformed or reincarnated human according to these uh, Purafati narrations in the sources. But you know, you, you are laughing and smiling at this. Um, and I myself sometimes wonder how scholars maintain a straight face while they discuss these narrations uh, and sometimes even authenticate them and base actual fiqh on them. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, this, this is a sad reality. Uh, inshallah, I, I, if I, we have the opportunity, I'll actually uh, show you the texts and also compare and contrast them with what's there in, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. So you actually understand where these understandings were imported from. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I hope, I hope that, uh, that we can, we can cover these questions because there are some questions that are like seriously interesting. And I know, uh, time, time, time is always against us, but, uh, inshallah, let's, let's have a follow-up session on this, um, soon. Um, everybody is, uh, is, is super happy and, uh, appreciating uh, your time and your knowledge and uh, I hope uh, you can actually invite others to subscribe to the channel uh, to watch the video and if you have questions you can always email them to us or um, in some way follow us and then we can uh, try and get them uh, to say it who could then automatically add it uh, into his next uh, session if that's okay. Um, Jaffer has raised his hand. Would you allow me a minute with him, if you don't mind? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jaffer Arunga. You can unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for the session. It's uh, very interesting already. Uh, uh, we're getting a lot of knowledge from it. Uh, sorry, but uh, I, I asked, uh, my, my question already been answered. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. I'd like to thank everybody for joining the session. Um, I hope it was as uh, enlightening uh, for you as it was for me. Um, Said again, may Allah bless you with more knowledge and uh, time that you share with us. Uh, Barakallah. Thank you very much for having me and for being a very gracious host uh, and for bearing with me uh, as usual. And yeah, I look forward to doing more of these inshallah with you and uh, hopefully contributing to more enlightenment and more awareness about these issues inshallah in our communities. Thank you so much. Ma'as-salam. Ma